This is The Fit Mess with Zach and Jeremy. Well, like the fancy voice just said, this is The Fit Mess. My name is Jeremy. His name is Zach. What's up, everyone? Thanks so much for listening to the show. Uh, our website, thefitmess.com, is where you can find out more about us uh, if you're new to the show. And if you are new to the show, welcome. This is uh, the best place, I think, to start to figure out who we are and, and why the hell we do this little show every uh, couple weeks or so. Zach and I have been talking the, the last few days, really texting in, in the modern era and because we're on opposite coasts, and really just sort of talking about the state of the world and where we're all sitting in it. And because everything has changed so much, because school isn't school anymore and, and work doesn't happen in an office anymore, it feels like this is an opportunity for on a grand scale, the world to reevaluate its priorities, to reevaluate our systems, our structures, our institutions. On a smaller scale, it's an opportunity for families to evaluate what they want their lives to look like, and down to the individual, what you want out of this life. My wife and I had been doing that, in, in, well, we've been doing it for years, but really in the last few months, We've been talking a lot about what do we want out of this life? We're, you know, we're in our forties. We're, we're over the hump. We're over the hill. You're and, old. And trying to figure out what is, what is it going to look like on the way down? What do we want out of the second half? And this COVID lockdown quarantine situation has opened a door to really paving your own way. If you can work from anywhere, if you can go to school from anywhere, why are we carrying this huge mortgage? Why are we carrying this debt that we've had forever when the place that we do everything from could be sold and pay for a simpler, smaller life somewhere else? These are the, some, some of the conversations that we're having. There's some instability in my wife's job, and that is putting a, a spotlight, a white hot spotlight on all of these questions and so we're we're diving deep into trying to find those answers and and in doing so we're sort of taking stock of how we got here what our background is and and Zach you and I have been talking for a long time about just for for the sake of this show and and the journey that we've been on particularly in the last few years sort of revealing more of how we got here and and what that struggle is and I feel like my story sort of picks up as a uh, as a as a, as a spinoff to your story, <laughs> so if you don't mind, I want to co- kind of start with you and and sort of what put you on this path to giving a shit about your health, about your mental well being, about your just uh, your quality of life and what you wanted to do. So so let's start with you. Let's let's just make it let's just make it weird. Let's get vulnerable. Let's talk about you. How did you get to the place where you are, where you're every couple of weeks talking into a microphone? about the tips and the tools and the tricks that you use to, to live a better life. Yeah, the story is, um, so I had to, you know, in preparation for this, I had to write some of it down and it was, um, really kind of sucked the life out of me as I, as I was typing it out and just thinking about what I was going to say here. Um, but yeah, I, this show exists because the two of us have struggled through a lot. And, um, I, I don't want to come off as, you know, somebody who appears to have it all together today. Um, I don't want to come off as the guy who's just kind of been like a spoiled brat his entire life. Like, you know, I, I dealt with some pretty serious stuff as I grew up, um, either through decisions that were made by, um, the people who were supposed to be my parents or decisions that I made, you know, it, it, it all kind of starts with the fact that anxiety runs through my family. Mm-hmm. My mom has crippling anxiety to the point, uh, where when I was born, I, um, I had a heart defect, I had a, a valve that didn't work right. And there were symptoms there. I was, you know, it was hard for me to catch my breath. Um, just like, you know, um, drinking milk or eating, um, was really a big struggle for me as a baby. And it, my mom completely ignored it. There's no problem. This isn't a problem. She, 
you know, and crippling anxiety to the point where my life was in jeopardy. And, um, my aunt was the one who actually recognized it and took me to the hospital where they found that I had a heart defect. And how was, how old were, were you? To, how old were you at that point? A month. You were a month old. A month old. Holy and shit. yeah. Um, cause my mom had to go in for surgery right after I was born mm-hmm. and my aunt fortunately got to take care of me for a week while my mom was in the hospital. So had that not happened, I'd probably be dead right now because my mom's anxiety would have stopped her from taking care of this yeah. issue. Yeah. So, you know, that starts the story, like the anxiety running in the family. And I inherited that from my mom. There's all these things we get from our parents, right? Mm-hmm. Some of it's good. Some of it's bad. <laughs> I, I got that from her. But I lived with my mom until I was six and heart was fine. Like things all worked out. We, we went and we went and dealt with it, but I lived with her until I was six, at which point, um, child protective services had to come in and yank me out just due to the fact that my mom was, she'd leave for days on end and go out and party and leave my sister and my, and I alone for days. And she was seven. All right. Well, it started happening when I was four. So she was seven, I was four. And then, um, but still, like, you don't leave kids that young. Was was alone. that was that a symptom or, or a, um, an aspect of her anxiety? Or was that just rampant irresponsibility? Probably a little bit of both. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I had been stealing food from the grocery store so that my sister and I could eat. When you were and, five or six years old? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And um, I got caught. So that's how they, like, it was that, and there was um, the fact that my sister and I weren't going to school, Uh and, you know, there's a a variety of things where people were like, huh, something's not right Right. here, but, so because I was actually the one who got caught stealing, I was the one that got pulled away first, Okay, and all, we were all going to go into um, a foster home, but my dad stepped up and learned years later that he left my mom and left all of us because my mom was batshit crazy. <laughs> but so no, I don't blame him. But uh, anyway, so six years old, Child Protective Services yanks me. I go live with my dad. My dad was raised in the 30s. Like he was he was 50 when I was born. So very old school, grew up in the Depression. Being a boy with around him was tough because, you know, his his answer to everything was get up, rub some dirt in it. Mm-hmm, right. Mm-hmm. And as we've come to find out, like I'm a very highly sensitive person. So that didn't work well, but he did the best he could, you know, he was, he was a good guy. Um, so anyway, fast forward a little bit. Like I dropped out of high school when I was 15, I went and took my GED test without even studying for it, passed it. And up into this point, like everyone had called me stupid and lazy and fat and like, all these things come to find out years later that like I, I had sleep apnea really bad. Like wasn't lazy. I had sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. Wasn't stupid. I was actually kind of smart, just crippling anxiety. Mm -hmm. So I dropped out, got my GED, started college, dropped out of college, worked at motels and gas stations for a few years. But then my dad came back and said, it was actually right after nine 11. Um, he's like, I'll pay for, you know, for your room and board if you go to college. So I was like, all right, I'll do it. Fine. I'm tired of working third shifts. Um, Was there, was uh, there something about 9-11 that, that triggered that? How did that, how did that happen? How did he decide this is the point to, to swoop in and do something? So it happened to be that day. So I was living with some friends because I didn't have anywhere to live. I was for a while. I left, I lived in my car for about six months um, in Syracuse, which was not fun in the wintertime. But, um, it, like 9-11 happened and, you know, I had a falling out with the guy I was living with at that point. And I called him and I was like, I, I just need help. Like I, okay. I, and he came and got me and he's like, Hey, you can live in the house. I'll feed you, clothe you. I'll pay for your stuff. Just go to college. And so I, I took him up on it and I actually finished my bachelor's degree in three years. Jeez. That's where I met my wife who surprisingly was like the very first person in my entire life who was like, Hey, have you ever like thought about the fact that you're kind of (laughs) smart? You know, 20, how old was I? Like 23, something like that. Right. 
very first person who like encouraged me to like speak and like say my ideas out loud. Right. And, um, which is really interesting. So anyway, I finished my undergrad in three years, got my first job and, um, it was my first corporate gig and, uh, they had a a 5k that they ran every summer and you got to leave work early that day. So I was like, (laughs) ah, I'm in, I can do that. But I also wanted to be like the social butterfly and like join in. Um, at the time I was 300 pounds, like, holy shit, like 200, 295, something like that. I smoked two packs of cigarettes a day. I ate Taco Bell every single day. Like I would stop in on my way home from work. There was this awesome Taco Bell slash Long John Silvers. <laughs> so I could get two chalupas and I could get a whole bunch of hush puppies. That was oh my God. the best. <laughs> um, so I was like incredibly obese, had sleep apnea, smoked, ate like crap. And all like all of this, and and then I, you know, I I ran this race. I at three hundred pounds at three hundred pounds smoking and Taco Bell. You ran a five k. Yeah. So my first job, like my boss, when I went in for the interview, I was like, okay, I'm gonna go in for an interview. So I put on a um a nicotine patch instead of smoking that day, so I wouldn't smell like cigarette smoke. Mm-hmm. And then I got the job, and my first day, and my boss figured out that I smoked, and he was like. If I had known you smoked, I wouldn't have hired you. Wow. And there was that was like the final straw for me. I was like, all right, nobody else in this office smokes. I, it's time to it's time to ditch these. So I quit. Peer pressure is a hell uh, of a drug. It is. So I, I ended up quitting and then the race was nine months later. So um I had never really run in my entire life. And like that first mile took me like ten tries. And it was horrible. But then like I don't know, 30 pounds fell off. And then I just started running and running and running and ended up doing like a half marathon and stuff like that to today where I'm like a workout junkie, I would say Mm -hmm. like I can't survive without it. But right. Yeah. So like my career took off and it was weird. Like I would come home from work and be like, I just got a promotion (laughs) and they're paying me. (laughs) And I'd be telling my wife this stuff and like my anxiety was just so bad. And I had such negative thought processes about myself Uh that I'd be like, I'm making this much money. How is that even possible? Like, do they even know who I am? Like if they knew who I was, they wouldn't do any fierce, fierce imposter syndrome. Oh my God. It was so bad. But yeah. And I got to, I got to the point where like, it was just a few years ago where I got diagnosed with like crippling anxiety I thought my anxiety was normal, but mm-hmm. like my entire life, I've dealt with all of this stuff mm-hmm. with anxiety that's off the charts. And it's, you know, just in the last, you know, five to seven years that I've figured out how to iron it out and uh, work with the anxiety. And and here we are doing a show on all of the things that I've learned over this fucked up life. <laughs> One of the things that's interesting on, you know, because uh, just uh, revealing the curtain a little bit, we share a document with all of our notes. You didn't even mention that in the process of the, I mean, you did say you lost a ton of weight, but you lost a hundred pounds. Yeah. I was almost 300. A hundred I'm sitting at like pounds. 200 now. Damn. That is huge. And, but, but was that your goal or did your lifestyle, your lifestyle just shifted and your body adapted? Yeah. It was never a goal to like lose weight. It just right. happened. Wow. That's so cool. You definitely don't paint a rosy picture of your childhood, but um, there's conversations we've had about the kinds of things that you did have to eat when you weren't stealing from the grocery store. <laughs> I don't know if you want to raw. get into into that. You mean the raw hamburger? The raw hamburger. Yes. It was. I mean, I I I just want to acknowledge that we are two relatively, you know, middle class white dudes with all the privilege that comes along with that. But within that, there is struggle, and it's all relative, and there are things that we will never suffer that people of other backgrounds and other ethnicities and, and things, we will never have to struggle like them. But mm-hmm. struggle is, real, is relative, and it's real for everyone. And when I think about my upbringing and, and the struggles I went through, you know, for the longest time, you know, people would say things to me like, how you survived is 
uh, is amazing. Like you should, you should celebrate that you survived it. Yeah. But my upbringing was fucking paradise compared to <laughs> what you described. So it's always interesting to me how, whether it's cultural or what, I don't, I don't know where, where the, where the need to compare ourselves to others comes from. But it's always interesting to me that no matter how much I compare myself to others and wish, you know, I had it as good as them, someone else went through or is currently going through something far worse every time. Like I, I don't, I don't care how bad it is, like until you're dead, mm -hmm. someone has it worse. Always. I don't, I, I don't know. You... I don't know how low on the chain you have to get to be like this one per who, this is the person on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> that there's nobody they can look to and go, you know, oh, that poor bass. Like they're the that there's somebody who has it worst, but we'll never know who they're. But that struggle is real. No matter what your struggle is, your struggle might be so much better than than what you've already heard, but it's as real as what you went through. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's all personal, right? There's always somebody who had it worse. Um I, I say a lot at work that there's always somebody better who could do the job, right? There's always someone better. Mm -hmm. And I usually am referring to myself, right? And like, right. Hey, we're doing, we're all doing the best job that we can. It, it's usually when somebody is a little down on themselves for like making a mistake or something like that. They're like, Hey, listen, there's always someone who can do the job better, but you're here now. And it's the same the other way. There's always somebody who had it worse because my life sucked, but there's somebody who, their life sucked worse. Yeah. Right. And down the chain, down the chain. Um, and then you add like all of history into it. <laughs> right. And that bottom peg is, whew, I don't well, even that's, want to think about that. You know, I, I keep hearing the, the, uh, the comparisons between the current, uh, mask controversy. Every, oh, uh, you know, no government's going to tell me to wear a mask or whatever because of the, the COVID situation. But, when you compare it to what like people went through during World War II or or a hundred years ago when this happened last time, we have it so good. Like yeah. before all this came along, all any of us wanted to do was sit on the couch and watch Netflix. And the minute someone said, Hey, sit on your couch and watch Netflix for the next six weeks, everyone went, <laughs> Fuck that, man. You can't tell me what to do. Yeah. It's just it's uh, we're, we're we're such a strange animal. I don't understand us. We are. So that's the path that you've been on. And like I said, I think that, that my life in, in some ways is a spinoff of yours. When I, when I think of it in this context, um, I grew up in a, in a relatively middle-class family. I had a dad who learned growing up that the way to contribute to the family is to work. And so that's where he put his efforts was work. And so he was gone a lot, working late a lot. And then, you know, out with his buddies afterward to blow off some steam a lot. So dad wasn't necessarily around much. I, like you, I, I, I was a smart kid. Um, somebody at some point, I, I remember being in like the, the good readers club or whatever it was called. I remember being pulled aside <laughs> at one point and being like, hey, you know, kid, you read good. You, you should come to this other thing. And I remember that feeling cool. Like I got to bail on the class with all the dummies and go over yeah. to the special group where we got to read and stuff because we were cool and smart and new stuff. And around around that time, shortly after, uh, my parents split up. And I know that that was... I know that's a point in my life where things sort of went off the rails because I, I all my life, have dealt with depression, anxiety issues. I think a lot of them come from that, from growing up in a house where alcohol was a big thing. So as my parents split that I think amplified the anxiety and back then you didn't we didn't know what that was. We didn't right. you know kids didn't have anxiety that wasn't a thing. So that it just created a spiral that eventually like you led to me dropping out of high school. Partially because the girl that I was into also dropped out of high school and that seemed like a cool thing to do is to drop out of high school and hang out with my girlfriend. Yeah, that makes sense. Um so that that ended well as as you can tell. Uh <laughs> But through that process, I then uh, eventually went back and I did get a diploma, though I had to drop in and out a couple more times. But but similar to you, not not from my dad, but my aunt actually stepped up at one point and said, 
you know, hey, education is something important. You're going to need it. I'll pay for it. Just if you'll go, I'll pay the bill. Mm -hmm. And I felt like an idiot, you know, saying no. So I did. And same thing. I powered through, got my diploma through college while also earning college credit. Um, eventually got an associate's degree and felt like good enough. You know, school's not my thing. I don't need more than that. I have a job. I'll be fine. And that that ultimately was a, a demon that haunted me for a long time. I, I still, to this day, don't feel like a very smart person. I don't feel like I'm very um, knowledgeable about many things. And, and a lot of it is because of the things the things I talked about at the beginning of the show. Like, we're in a position where we're considering completely resetting our life. So that makes me question every decision I made that got me here. Because if I don't want to hang on to what I've got then there's something wrong with what I've got, which is a result of bad decisions. Mm, Do you follow me on deep, that? That's you, a deep rabbit hole. Is it? Did I go too far down the rabbit hole? Did, did I make sense? No, it made perfect okay. sense. Okay. It made perfect sense. So, but so it's a deep rabbit hole. Yeah. But that's, <laughs> that's where, you know, I spend a lot of time down there. Um, but you know, going back a little bit, I decided at one point, I was super into politics. I, I fell into radio. I, you know, I had um, I worked in movie theaters and video stores, which is where I met my wife, and uh, eventually Starbucks. Worked there for a long time, and fell into radio. I knew a guy who invited me to come and watch a show uh, that he worked on, and I, I just I fell in love with it. I, at that point, I, you know, I still had dreams of being a musician, of being a rock star. I was like, oh, radio. That's you know, that's a foot in the door. That'll be great. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, applied for a job. And I, I, I remember my first job was something like weekend, part-time fill-in board operator. If we're super desperate, we might give you a call, something like that. <laughs> and Sounds uh, sounds reliable. Yeah, exactly. But it was the kind of thing where it turned out they needed me on weekends and overnight and part-time and when they got super desperate. And when I was there, rather than just, you know, pushing the button that I had to push every 20 minutes, I would spend time in between learning how to edit audio, how to write, how to do all these things. Mostly because I was bored. It was like, mm -hmm. you know, if, if I can learn a different skill, maybe I can get a different job. And within a few months, I worked my way up and, and got different promotions and ended up producing different shows. And now, as it turns out, I've been in radio for 21 years or something like that. Long ass time. During that lifetime, I had what I, what I describe as a complicated relationship with booze. Um, I don't think I was ever an alcoholic. I don't think I was ever an addict of any kind. Um, drugs were never really my thing, but I, I enjoyed a beer or nine, uh, <laughs> <laughs> often. And, you know, that, that leads to some other poor decisions about, you know, the food that you're eating with that beer, because you're probably at a place where, you know, it's not the highest quality nutrition that they're serving with their, you know, 47, uh, IPAs that are on tap. And, you know, exercise was never my thing. I was, I was never like a fitness guy. It wasn't, you know, I wasn't striving to get into any gyms or anything. So, you know, I also was, I, I didn't, I didn't get quite to 300 pounds. I got close, but the, but the roller coaster has gone up and down most of my life. And it was about, I think you might remember better than me. I think it was four years ago. We went camping for Memorial Day weekend. And sounds about right. I think. I think I was probably at the heaviest I've ever been. And I remember I was doing a different podcast uh, around that time. Maybe it, maybe it had ended shortly before. I don't remember. But I remember saying on that show that I basically had given up. Like, I, I was <laughs> like, I'm never going to lose weight. I'm never going to, you know, I'm never going to stop drinking. It's too much a part of my identity and everything that I do. I'm, I'm on these different shows. I'm involved in these different projects that all have something to do with beer this is who I am. I'm the big fat beer drinking dude. That's my life. And, and I resigned myself to it. And, but around that time I got into a bike crash and broke a collarbone, a couple ribs. And it was, it wasn't necessarily like a, an aha moment or an epiphany, but it became one because in the course of rehabbing from the injury, I ended up doing physical therapy. And that 
ended up leading to um, just doing more exercise. And it's so funny how, how fuzzy it is to me now, but I just know that in the course of recovering from that, I don't know that I, that I felt like, oh man, it was a near death experience and man, I got to turn things around. I don't think it was that black and white, but I started to feel better because I was moving more and, and taking a little bit better care of myself because I was trying to heal. And so through doing, you know, acupuncture probably a couple times a week and massage and physical therapy, all of a sudden I was taking care of me and started to value me more. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's where, I mean, we, we had been friends for quite a while at that point, but I remember one yep. morning waking up at our, at our campsites on Orcas Island, sitting at the uh, fire pit at, at your campground and talking about the success you'd had using the keto diet and how you dropped a ton of weight really quickly. Yep. And I was like, oh yeah, I remember I did the Atkins diet. Same thing. Weight fell off. I didn't have to do, all I ate was chicken and uh, <laughs> man, the weight just flew off. Something about that conversation clicked, whether it was, you know, Orcas Island, let's just say, let's just explain, is a place of magic. There's there's it just is. something about that place that you can't go there and come back the same. It's, it's an, an amazing place. But something about that conversation made me go, well, shit, I can try that. I mean, I'm, I'm doing this other stuff. Why not? Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking like, oh, I'm not going to go full keto. That's crazy. I'm a vegetarian. What am I, how am I going to do that? That's That's ridiculous. You can't protein up on, on vegetarian. <laughs> you can only eat so much tofu. But uh, I remember thinking, I'll just I'll start by cutting my carbs. I'll limit it to 100, 100 grams a day. That's it. And that literally skyrocketed to every other thing I've done since then because I think it was the same thing. I think I dropped like 30 or 40 pounds very quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, I got really serious about keto and then I started learning about intermittent fasting and I started learning, I think we'd interviewed Sean T. I think we started doing this show because we were having these kinds of conversations about, Hey, what's working? What's not, How, you know, did you try this? Have you read this book? Yep. And did the Sean T workout and between working out every day, fasting every day and not eating shit, I felt great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, all of a sudden, my brain, like there was no more fog. There was like indecision wasn't a, as big of a thing. Depression would would uh, vanish much more quickly than it had in the past. Everything was just working the way I felt like my body was always supposed to. I don't remember at what point. You know, I, I do remember what happened. After I finished Sean T's workout, it was the first video workout program I'd ever, ever completed. Mm -hmm. I remember that. And I remember this sense of, well, shit, what do I do now? Mm -hmm. And I, there was, I have this weird thing, even doing this show, I have this weird thing where maybe it's, maybe it's just being creative. I, I don't know. It's, I'm going to try and explain it. It's really weird. But until everything sort of mentally clicks and I can see the path, I can't take a step. And maybe, maybe that's an anxiety thing. Maybe it's a creativity thing. I don't know what it is, but. That's perfectionism. Maybe it is perfectionism, but but there are things that literally I, I don't know where to begin until I see a path or I see the context of the thing. So yeah. so when we interviewed Shanti, I had this context of that was an amazing experience to talk to somebody like that. He has this thing that's really cool. I can get on. I get I get the steps. Do this every single day. Really easy. But once it was over, it was up to me to go. Here's what's next. Mm -hmm. Try that. Go for a run every day. Build your own plan, whatever whatever the thing was. But I couldn't. I just, I couldn't make the, the Tetris puzzle come together. And so rather than even going like, oh, well, I'll just start that program over. I felt mm -hmm. like, well, I've done that. I don't need to see that movie again. <laughs> and so that became, became kind of a spiral of, well, I don't know what to do anymore. And everything came apart. I stopped sticking to my diet routine, stopped the fasting. St I stopped all the things I was doing. And ever since then, I've sort of been struggling to put those pieces back together to feel that same drive, I guess, that, that same sense that everything's working the way it's supposed to. And, you know, there have mm -hmm. been struggles and, and just life things that have come up along the way since then that, Coronavirus. that, that are always setbacks. Coronavirus, of course. <laughs> um, 
you had a taste. You're trying to get back. And it's frustrating because you, you had the taste. Exactly. And uh, so along the way, I, one of the things I did uh, a couple of years ago during the middle of all this, I don't remember where I picked it up, but something at some point I picked up the idea of just say yes. Whenever there's an opportunity, a question, a, a possibility, just say yes to it. Open up to it mm-hmm. and, and just welcome it and do whatever it is. And I ended up getting invited on this, this weekend retreat. It was a, it's a, for a, a program, I guess, for lack of a better word, called Radical Aliveness, which is um, sort of like group therapy, I guess, uh, like an alternative group therapy uh, with a lot of physical expression. The idea is that there's uh, your energy, your trauma, all of your stuff is uh, takes the form of energy that you carry with you in your body. And so they teach you ways to move your body or to express yourself to break that up and, and to release it. Mm-hmm. And it was one of the most profound experiences I've ever had in my life. It was like three days. They flew me down to Malibu. I stayed in this just amazing resort. It was incredible. Um, That's right. You had to buy skinny jeans for that, didn't you? I didn't have to, but I, I needed to buy some but clothes because you- it was it was going to be on TV. It was going to be a whole. Th- it was going to be like a reality show. So I had to go like buy stuff to not look like the homeless schlub that I usually look like. <laughs> and, but you uh, got. But you were able to fit into skinny jeans. Fit into skinny jeans. I still do. Still do. Um, the same ones, by the way, because I don't. I don't buy new clothes. And uh, <laughs> but but uh, over the course of that weekend, one of the things we did was we did this holotropic breath work, which is, I guess, the best way to describe it is as, as close to doing like mushrooms or um, psychedelics without actually doing drugs. It's it's using a tech a breathing technique to elicit basically a high and depending on your point of view, uh, experiencing alternate realities or hallucinations, however you choose to perceive them. I did all that in high school. (laughs) I'm just kidding. (laughs) Many, many people did. Many people did. Um, But so the weird thing was I came back from that experience with this, this almost manic high that I've, since been chasing after it was, I came home with this sense of there's nothing I can't do. I'm the person I was always meant to be. I felt mm-hmm. more in my body than I have before or since everything just felt like, ah, finally, I know what it means to be alive. It was just the most incredible feeling. Um, but after a few weeks it uh, faded away and it has since become this dragon that I'm chasing and I've gotten tired, so I don't chase it as much. <laughs> you know, it's a, all that running wears you out. But um, but it's this, it has created this anchor for me of that's how I'm supposed to feel, which then messes with my sense of, you know, being in the now, being in the moment, accepting all of, all of that when I know there's a better feeling. Mm-hmm. So again, I, I don't want to get too far in my weird rabbit hole, but... So I wrestle between be present, be now, be accepting, and but you can feel like that. Go find ways to feel like that. That's the way you want to live your life. Mm-hmm. So under that umbrella, we find ourselves here in the middle of a pandemic, in a quarantine, locked down, and trying to come to terms, at least for me, maybe I don't want to speak for you, I'm trying to come to terms with who I am and how I now want to spend the second half of my life when I don't know what next month is going to look like in the world. I don't know. I mean, you you never really know, right? But we've always had this framework of go to work, pay your bills, retire, die, you know, whatever. Now, I don't know if I'm ever going to have to go back to my office. I don't know if my kids are ever going to see the inside of a classroom again. Right. And so it's again, it just has me and, and our family going, how do we make the most of this? How do we make sure that, you know, starting today, the rest of our life is exactly what we want it to be instead of paying for the mistakes that we've made in the first half. Mm. And so that's where we that's where we are now. Well, I will say that you're always gonna pay for your mistakes as long as you move forward avoiding future mistakes. So just keep that in mind. Yes. 
And those past mistakes, as it turns out, were very expensive. <laughs> they always are. <laughs> they always are. Always. Yeah, and I think, you know, I, one of the main points in telling in telling our background is really just to kind of point out the fact that we are, you know, we are here. We are um, acknowledging that the future looks kind of interesting and and we don't know where it's going, but both of us at several points in our lives were in similar, similar situations where we just had no idea where our life was going mm -hmm. and we had to pick a direction and go that way. Mm -hmm. um, fortunately, we made some better choices the older we got. Thought I knew everything at 20. Apparently, I, I only knew 50% of everything. Tell me, if this um, is, tell me if this is the case for you, though. Like, I... I feel like a lot of times we talk about decisions and, and choices we made about the, the path that we go on. I don't remember making a lot of choices as much as adapting to reality. I mean, I made a choice about the way I was going to eat after talking to you. I mean, that was, that was a clear choice that I made, but a lot of the, a lot of the mistakes, particularly financial that uh, I'm now paying for were never like, Oh man, I'm going on a, bender to mexico for a month and i'm just gonna spend everything I, like i never made dumb choices it was more responding to emergencies responding to things that needed to be dealt with i feel like a lot of my life has has been reaction rather than action reaction and immediate gratification right yes your your decisions are they don't feel like decisions or they don't feel like choices if you're just going to go eat a burger and fry, right? There's nothing behind that except the dopamine rush. Right. If you're going to go eat healthy, you're eating healthy for a long-term effect and you're making a choice to be healthy. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. When I was watching a movie with my kids last night after a very stressful day and eating tons and tons of candy, that was not a <laughs> long-term thoughtful choice. That was, this sucks. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stress eat the shit out of this. Exactly. <laughs> so a lot of the choices that we make or that, that we regret for me anyway, were choices that were made in the moment that were made, uh, without guidance from other people, um, were made with, with, um, nothing but the next day in front of me. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I honestly never thought I'd live past 20 to begin with. So like, I think I'm doing okay, but yeah, yeah, not bad. If that was uh, if that was the bar, <laughs> doubled. <laughs> Again, old. <laughs> um, when you're making a thoughtful choice that you have vetted with other people, that is in the best interest of you for the long term, right? That those are the choices that you remember. It's mm -hmm. the choices that you didn't do any of those things that you just at a moment's notice went. I'm going to eat that burger and fry or mm -hmm. I'm going to smoke that cigarette or I'm going to do X, Y, and Z that when you continually make those choices and you don't realize you're making choices, uh, add up to just issues later on in life. So yeah, financial healthy health, health ones like mental health choices, right? Avoiding, you know, I would have died because my mom avoided the fact that I had a problem. Yep. Right. Yep. She made a choice, it, but in those, in those senses, like it doesn't feel like a choice. It's just something you did in the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, for me anyway. All right. So that's our story. That's who we are. That's how we got to wherever it is that we are now. So you might be wondering, uh, you know, aside from belly aching and whining about our childhoods, what's the point of this show? What's the point of this episode? What am I supposed to take away from it other than, I guess I know a little bit more about you guys now. Yeah. So the point of the show is really about how everyone listening can take small steps to make their life better. Right. And we really wanted to share our story to let everyone know that we've taken those small steps. We've, we've, we've come from a really dark place in many instances and actually taken those small steps fought through the fit mess the whole the the name of this show is very personal for me because it was messy um and getting it to, to a fit state was was really tough so 
you know, this is, we're not on here just rambling about here's the latest trend. Here's the coolest thing. Here's, here's an expert who can talk about this. We've actually lived through this. We've, we've done what we're talking about and we've gotten ourselves to a point where we're, we're okay with who we are. Um, 10 years ago, that was not the case, but, um, yeah. And and I'll add, I'm, I'm more okay with myself now than I was a year ago, but I mean, my path is far from, from its end. And, And I don't mean that in some, like I've got some great goal I'm trying to achieve. It just means that I, I don't know what I don't know. And I'm trying to keep myself open to whatever it is I'm supposed to learn here or that I'm you know, going to learn, whatever, you know, whatever uh, way of life you subscribe to, I'm still here, so there's still some point in continuing. And so I'm going to keep working on myself because I think that's the best gift I can give to my family is the, the healthier I am and the better a person I am, the better husband and father I'm going to be for them. And don't get me wrong. I'm a shit show. Like I, I still have a lot of growing to do and, and a lot of work to do, but compared to where I was when I started this for real, like four years ago, I mean, I'm, I've come a long way. And so, you know, I don't, I don't often give myself credit for, for the work that I've done and, and the success that I've had. Um, and even as I'm saying this now, I'm realizing, I'm sort of realizing that for the first time. But I, I think that it's important to remember that while we offer tips and advice and, and glimpses at things that we've done, I don't know that it's ever perfect. I don't, I don't know that you're ever going to find a place in your life. Maybe, maybe people have. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe people get to a point where they're like just perfectly satisfied with everything life has to offer for good and bad. Um, I'm not. I'd be, I'd be really bored at that point, though. Yeah. Like that. This is this is what keeps me going is, is getting better, growing, changing the process and, and making things better. We talked about it earlier. There's, there's always something you can make better. Yep. Always. And someone's always got it worse. So exactly. The only person to compare yourself to is yourself and your own path and your own journey. I think, I I don't know. I, I hope, I guess I hope that's the takeaway is that wherever you are in your journey, just starting 20 years ahead of us, way more mentally, physically fit than us or worse, whatever. Uh, I remember early on, I think you said it, Zach. I think you said it to the listener. Wherever you are in this struggle, you're perfect right where you are. I have a hard time remembering that for myself. Um, but I think it's I think it's true. I think that absolutely is true is that wherever you are is perfect because if it wasn't, you wouldn't be there. Yep. The choices you make moving forward determine the comparison that I hope will be made against yourself and the, and the next step you take from there. Did that make sense? Am I I rambling again? Am I getting down a weird rabbit hole again? (laughs) No. Well said. Uh, All right. Well, yeah. You hit on the comparison thing. I like that. The only person you can compare yourself with is yourself. And for me, I like to look back and say, I'm better than, than I was a year ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's all we can do. Absolutely. Well, have we blabbed on long enough? Sure. (laughs) We could go for hours. Yeah. We've Uh, got content for, for years oh, worth of shows on this topic. We've got so much uh, complaining and whining to do. You have no idea. Well, with that, we'll wrap uh, wrap up this episode. I, you know, I, I, could, I it's not often that we know uh, exactly what we're going to be talking about on the next show uh, or who our guest is going to be. But in this case, we do know. I'm really excited. We're going to be talking to uh, Gary John Bishop. Uh, if you haven't read his book, Unfuck Yourself, uh, it's, it's fantastic. He has a new book that uh, is available very soon, I believe uh, Tuesday, depending on what day you're listening to this show. But he will be on our next episode, and I'm very excited to talk to him. Uh, a lot of great advice and, and, a, and a terrific new book that we'll be talking all about. Uh, so that'll be available on our feed. So if you subscribe, good for you. You'll hear it. If you don't, head on over to Apple Podcasts or whatever device you use to get your podcast and subscribe. 
Uh, again, our website is thefitmess.com. And we would love your feedback about this episode, any episode, your struggle, what what uh, rang true for you, what you, what resonated with you, what sounds like something you went through, or, you know, tell us to blow it out, out our ass, whatever you want to do. Our, uh, our email, info at thefitmess.com or through any of our social media channels. We're always on there uh, and, and ready to hear from you. Thanks so much for listening to this. I hope that this uh, has provided some insight into who we are and, and why we do this show and what motivates us to keep coming back every couple of weeks to do it. Uh, again, we'd love to hear from you uh, however, however you see fit. And uh, until then, we will see you next time at thefitmess.com. See you, everyone. We know this podcast is amazing and does not seem to lack anything, but we do need a legal disclaimer. Jeremy and Zach are not doctors. They do not play them on the Internet, and even if they did play them on the Internet, they would be really bad at it. Please consult your physician prior to implementing any changes that you heard on this podcast. The listener assumes that Jeremy and Zach do not know what they are talking about and that you will do your own research on the topics talked about on this podcast.